The English-born John Milton is considered by some as one of the greatest poets to ever write in the English language. Two distinguishing background facts about Milton are his devout Christian faith and his wavering sight, which progressed to the point where he was blind. In Milton's When I Consider How My Light Is Spent, Milton struggles with the physical and spiritual reality of losing his sight, which took place sometime in the mid-1600s. He views his blindness also as a possible judgment from God for his lack of works or active service. But as the poem continues, Milton makes peace with God and his blindness, noting that he is able to serve in any capacity God has set out for him. In the first section of his poem, Milton shares the struggle of losing his sight, the question of how he will work in God's kingdom, and the despair he faces due to his blindness. In the first two lines of his poem, Milton writes, when I consider how my light is spent, are half my days in this dark world and wide, Milton reflects on his loss of sight that came during the Middle Ages. Milton's days have become darkened by his loss of sight. He begins by mourning his spent light, which is a sight, and then he speaks about the world's darkness. The dark world and wide has multiple meanings for one. Milton's blindness makes the world dark in a literal sense. But in a more figurative sense, Milton's world has become dark because he is having a crisis of faith. In line 3, Milton links his blindness with the woes of the servant that the master judges. In the octave, Milton writes about a talent, which is death to hide. Milton refers here to Matthew 25 verses 14 to 30. In this story, the master gives three servants each some talents to use while the master goes away. Five of the talents went to one servant. Another servant received two talents, but the master gives one particular servant only one talent. Milton views himself as a servant who only receives one talent. Rather than the servants who were given more, a deeper level of despair for Milton is discovered as Jesus' parables continue. When the master returns to a servant, all but one servant uses the talents adequately. The servant tries to explain. He speaks about his fear of the master, how he hid the talent in the ground, which was considered a reasonable thing to do at that time, and why he did not put the talent to work. But the master is upset and takes back the talent. The servant with the one talent is judged and scolded for burying his talent instead of making use of it. Craig Keener, a biblical scholar, rightfully summarizes the moral of the text stating, whereas the other servants are rewarded by the master's benevolence, this servant, fearing the master's harshness but unaware of his benevolence, experiences the very wrath he feared. This, says Jesus, is what will happen to those who claim to be his followers but do not invest in their lives the work of the kingdom. Well, you have what is yours. Probably no servant was going to speak that way to the master because that was an insult. Take what is yours. And, and, he, and he said, the reason I did it this way is because I was afraid because you're so mean. That also was an insult. I mean, we often don't read it that way in our culture, but in that culture, that's, that's what he was saying. He's just insulting the master as, as his excuse I didn't really want you basically to, to make any money off this that you left for me. So I'm just giving you what's yours because you're mean. I don't like you. Well, he gets in big trouble. We don't want to treat God that way. God has given us resources. We need to use those resources, whatever gifts he's given us, whatever uh, economic resources he's given us. Use them for the furtherance of the kingdom. Don't insult God. Milton, coming from a reformed Calvinist background, gives the reader a more comprehensive understanding of how Milton theologically understands God. In reformed theology, God is sovereign and everything in life is predetermined to show God's attributes such as mercy, love, or judgment. Ultimately, everything is worked out by God for his glory. Milton may be struggling with what side of God's sovereignty he might be experiencing, a blessing or a judgment. Sympathizing with the servant, Milton possibly even suggests with the notion that God took away his sight because he has not been a faithful worker. The last line of when I consider how my light is spent reveals a turning point in Milton's thought. Milton asks an optimistic but essentially foolish question about what labor God requires of him. In lines 9 through 14, Milton hears a murmur that says, God doth not need either man's works or his gifts. 
who best bear his mild yoke? They serve him best. His state is kingly, thousands at his bidding speed, and post over land and ocean without rest. They also serve who only stand and wait. In these lines, a reassuring voice speaks to him. The voice showcases a change in Milton's thinking. God does not require anything from man. For what could God stand to gain from the works of man? Milton is reassured that his faith in Christ is adequate, and this thought is best expressed in Milton's final line, they also serve who only stand and wait. Milton is aware of God's kingly state, and as long as he is a citizen of the king's sovereign nation, he can serve as he stands and waits for his time to come. John Milton was a master of poetry, even when he was not able to see it. His faith in God gave Milton the resolve to serve in times of darkness. Milton views his blindness as a possible judgment from God for his lack of works. He views himself as a servant, scolded and judged by the master in one of Jesus' parables. Milton is also under the impression that God may also be punishing him for being an unworthy servant. Milton comes to understand that his value before God does not come from human works, which God does not need. Rather, it comes from allegiance to God's kingdom. Milton comes to this understanding that he can become a faithful servant of God as long as he only stands and waits.